Hi, this is Anand Shankar back here to talk about speech recognition. So in this section, I'm going to go over how speech recognition systems work. Now, why should we care about speech recognition for video understanding? Well, as you know, video has two components. The first component is the visual track of the video, and the second component is the audio track of the video. Many videos have this audio, uh, use this audio track for a person's speech, for example, a meeting recording or a video of a course where somebody is teaching the course, the audio track is usually somebody speaking. So if we do speech recognition on the audio track and produce speech recognition transcripts, we will have uh, information that is independent of the visual features. These transcripts, transcripts can also be used to index videos using keywords found in the transcripts. Not only really that, these transcripts can be used to directly randomly jump into a specific part of the video where a specific word is being spoken. So not only really can we index the video, but we can even uh, index timestamps of the video, which is very cool because we can random access straight into important parts of the video. We can use the transcripts also to do things like topic modeling, extracting topic features, and all of these features can be used for downstream tasks like spam and low quality content detection, as well as recommendation and search systems. So now I'm gonna go over speech recognition technology. I will cover some of the traditional ways in which speech recognition was done, just to give you a understanding of how we've gone from traditional systems to neural network systems, I would say in the last uh, 10 years, uh, since about 2010 to 2020. In about 2010, in that time frame, we were still using more traditional speech recognition systems based upon hidden Markov models and statistical language models. And now, 10 years later, there are end-to-end -end neural systems using uh, for speech recognition. And I will trace that, uh, that, that transition from traditional modeling to end-to-end -end neural modeling. So let's start with how speech recognition systems work at a high level. So here is a recording of me saying the sentence, this is speech. You have the acoustic waveform on the top. The waveform is typically sampled at about 16,000 samples a second. In the middle section, we have what is called a spectrogram, which is essentially a spectral representation of speech at every uh, times at, at different time intervals. So every, ten, every uh, one, one hundred times a second, we compute a spectrum of the speech waveform and display it over here in time. And that constitutes what we call the spectrogram. Now you can think of the spectrogram as the features for speech. So every hundred times a second, uh, that means, uh, uh, so hundred times a second, we will compute a speech vector of dimensionality typically 40. So we have a 40 dimensional spectral vector computed hundred times every second. And we call these spectral vectors frames. In other words, this is called a speech frame. We can think of it very much like an image frame being the unit of a video. So here the speech frame is going to be the unit of a speech sequence, of an acoustic uh, vector sequence. These 40 dimensional spectral vectors are actually log spectral energies, but that's a detail we don't really need to worry about too much. This sequence of 40 dimensional spectral vectors, which are the features of speech, are sent to a speech recognition system, which then produce the final transcript. Hopefully if the speech recognition system got this right, it would output the sentence, this is speech, because that is what I actually said. As you can see, the input speech or waveform is sampled at about 16,000 samples a second. When we do feature extraction, we are at about 100 frames a second. But when we output words, we only have like two or three words per second, because that's the speed at which we utter words. A large decrease in the data, if you will, as we go from samples to words. Now in a traditional speech recognition system, we have a speech decoder that takes this input of speech uh, spectral features and outputs the speech, uh, the sequence of words. How does it do that? It basically tries to maximize the probability of a word sequence given the input spectral sequence, the input acoustic vector sequence. And that is done by using a Bayes rule to convert the probability of W given X, that is the words given the acoustic features, to a conditional likelihood of the acoustic features given the words, P of X given W, times 
the probability of the words themselves p of w. Now, this brings us to the different components of a traditional speech recognition system. The p of x given w is what is modeled, is modeled by what is called the acoustic model. And the p of w is the probability of the word sequence that is modeled by something called the language model. Essentially, the language model provides a set of constraints to the speech decoder that says only these sort of word sequences are okay. And within those constraints, we try to score the acoustic sequence x1, x2, x3 using the acoustic model. We also have a lexicon, which I will show you how it is used in the next slide, uh, rather in the slide after this. So I just wanted to sort of talk about here how the transition to neural models have happened. So, so far I've shown you how a traditional speech recognition system looks, looks like. It has an acoustic model, a lexicon, and a language model. So the first step in the transition to neural models was replacing the acoustic model with a Gaussian, which was, uh, which was usually modeled by a Gaussian mixture model, which is a statistical model. The Gaussian mixture model was replaced with a deep neural network to form the first transition to neural networks. That made a big hit in 2011. And we saw many, many advances after that till fairly recently. And in the last two or three years, people have been researching end-to-end encoder-decoder neural network models that replaces completely the acoustic model, the lexicon, and the language model with a single neural network model. And this is how an encoder-decoder neural network model looks. You have the input speech sequence, the spectral feature sequences, which are used to, in, which are input into the encoder model and the encoder model forms some understanding of the sequence of spectral sequences, or rather the sequence of spectral vectors. And the decoder network is simply a conditional language model that knows how to spit out word sequences, but it is conditioned on the representation that the encoder forms and therefore is able to recognize what the input speech is all about. I'll talk about this in more detail later. So coming back to the traditional speech recognition system, as I said, it is comprised of a language model, which tells us how to form sentences from words. And then we have a lexicon at the next level from the bottom, which tells us how to go from a sequence of phones, phonemes like de, e, se, to the words this. For example, the word this is the phoneme sequence the, e, followed by se. And then we have the acoustic model, which tells us how to go from the acoustic features to the phonemes. And the acoustic model is typically an HMM model, a three-state HMM model going from the left to the right. Normally in speech recognition, we don't model just phonemes. We model triphones, which are phonemes in the context of a left phoneme and a right phoneme. Now these HMM models are put together using the language model and the dictionary constraints. The acoustic uh, models for the, the HMMs for the acoustic models can be composed with the lexicon and the language model to put together a giant HMM graph. Any path through this graph is going to be a valid word sequence because it is constrained by the language model. And for a speech recognition system, what we're trying to do is to find the best path through this large HMM state graph and uh, given the input feature vector sequence. In order to do this, we need to be able to compute the likelihood for any HMM state for a given input feature vector x. And that is done, as I said before, using the acoustic model. And this best path was, was found by an algorithm called the Viterbi algorithm. It's a dynamic, uh, 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 it's a dynamic programming uh, algorithm called Viterbi algorithm. And that was used to, form, to find the best path through this graph. And that best path would correspond to the correct word sequence that the recognizer would output. So traditionally, we used to use Gaussian mixture models to model the individual states of the HMMs in the acoustic model. A Gaussian mixture model is basically something we've already seen when we talked about uh, cluster and aggregate techniques for uh, video recognition. We typically used to have in these sort of models about 10,000 HMM triphone states. And for each of these 10,000 HMM triphone states, we would have a separate Gaussian mixture model resulting in about 30 million parameters for the entire speech recognition system. The typical challenges we used to have in the past in traditional speech recognition system was that the most useful knob was the number of states. So by we could incre increase accuracy 
by increasing the number of states and the number of Gaussians in the Gaussian mixture model. But as you increase the number of states and Gaussians, we would have less data, data to estimate those parameters. And so we needed to come up with robust estimation techniques. Also, we had to train each state separately, which also caused data sparsity, resulting in the need for ro robust estimation. Discriminative training is another technique that also handled the idea, uh, handled the problem of uh, data sparsity, because with discriminative training, we could use all the data to train the parameters of all states. Another problem with traditional systems is we used to make very strong independence assumptions. We assume that, that the uh, frames are independent of each other, and within each frame that the components of the feature vectors are also independent of each other. These sort of assumptions were taken care of by discriminative training, Gaussian covariance modeling, and so forth. But they're all like a sort of uh, not directly addressing the problem, just uh, sol trying to address the problem by, uh, by building some modeling on top of it. Speaker normalization was another method that people used to address, to normalize out the effects of different speaker accents and speaking styles. With all these techniques, over the 10 year period from 1995 to about 2002, so about a seven year period, word error rates decreased significantly, but then plateaued out between 2000 and 2002. Here I'm showing the word error rates for a task called switchboard, which is a speech recognition, which is a conversational speech recognition task that the US government used to evaluate the sites that they sponsored to do speech recognition research. So once a year, these sites would get together and do a competition on the switchboard task, and they would have a meeting to see what research each person did to get to the error rates that they got to. And this sort of uh, uh, effort by the US, sponsor, US government sponsored speech recognition efforts reduced the word error rates from about 48% in 1995 to about 20% in 2000, and then it plateaued out. It didn't improve much further beyond that. Switchboard is a task where two different individuals are talking to each other on a given topic over the telephone. So it's highly conversational speech and pretty tough to, to, to actually recognize using a machine. So now enter neural networks. Let's talk about how neural networks have been used for speech recognition. Even in 1994, almost at the early point of the graph I showed you in the last slide, people had already tried to use neural networks for speech recognition by replacing the Gaussian mixture model by a deep neural network. However, the deep neural networks weren't very powerful in those days, and so we didn't get very good results. Then in 2009, Hinton and his students caused a resurgence of research in deep neural networks with their uh, papers on deep belief networks. And they found that they were able to get very good results by using deep neural networks. And a deep neural network is simply a neural network with many more layers and many more nodes. In other words, it's old wine in a new bottle, very similar to the neural networks that were researched in the 80s and 90s, but much deeper and with many more parameters. Uh, then in 2010, Hinton students interned at Microsoft, IBM, and Google to apply their ideas to large vocabulary speech recognition because these companies were doing a lot of work in large vocabulary speech recognition. And the first industry results in LBCSR, that is large vocab vocabulary speech recognition, were showed by Saide and his uh, group at Microsoft where they got a dramatic 32% reduction in word error rate simply by replacing a Gaussian mixture model by a deep neural network model. So here we show how Gaussian mixture models work. For each, as I said before, we have about 10,000 HMM triphone states. So those are this, uh, in this picture shown as S1 through S10,000 on the top of this picture on the left. Each of these 10,000 states is modeled by a Gaussian mixture model. And traditionally, each of these Gaussian mixture models was trained separately using maximum likelihood training. Now with deep neural networks, Again, we have those 10,000 states, but rather than mo modeling them as separate Gaussian mixture models, they're all modeled as the outputs of a single deep neural network, which takes as its input a speech uh, spectral vector. And because of this, we are able to uh, uh, automatically handle various things like independence assumptions and discriminative, discriminative training comes in for free. And this system can be is much more expressive and much more powerful than the Gaussian mixture model system that we have on the left. Now, simply by replacing a Gaussian mixture model with a deep neural network, Saida and his uh, group were able to reduce the word rates 
from by about 32% in 2011. Such a decrease was unheard of in those days when it was a huge gain and one of the first applications of deep neural networks in practice. So what was new? In 1994, Reynolds had the same idea of using deep neural networks for instead of Gaussian mixture models. The only difference was he had only 70, 69 HMM states as opposed to 9,300 states inside his paper. They used only one hidden layer as opposed to seven hidden layers with a total number of parameters of 300,000 versus 44 million. So basically a much larger network, which we could train uh, in today's uh, with, with much more uh, compute power and much larger amounts of data. This is what made the difference. Otherwise, the systems were very, very similar to each other. Then after DNNs showed a very dramatic gain in speech recognition, people used the idea of LSTMs, that is recurrent neural networks. They use long short time memory neural networks instead of DNNs and got further gains even on the acoustic modeling because of the temporal modeling aspects of LSTMs. And LSTMs were also used to do language modeling on top of the n-grams, which were used in a traditional hybrid HMM DNN uh, neural network system. And with these techniques, we were able to drive down the word error rates for the same switchboard task from 20% to 5%, which is another huge decrease in word error rate. And 5% was almost at human accuracy for this task. So as you can see, between 95 to 2002, we went from 48% to 19.8%, then a gap of uh, no gains till about 2011, and then we uh, got a gain to a 35% improvement from Sider's work. And then we have pushed the word error rate down all the way to 5% using neural network technology. So neural nets have made a huge difference in the area of speech recognition, as you can see. Now we will talk about end-to-end -end neural speech recognition. So we just talked about hybrid HMM neural network speech recognition. Now we will talk about an end-to-end -end speech recognition model called the listen, attend, and spell, or the last model. So in the listen, attend, and spell model, first we have a listening system. In the listen component, we take as input the input speech spectral feature sequence, and we input this to a bidirectional LSTM model. So you can see the arrows going in both directions, so that's a bidirectional LSTM model. And also it's a pyramidal model in the sense that as we apply more and more layers to this LSTM, we reduce the time resolution of the LSTM. That's the listen component. So the hidden representations of these LSTM states compose the representation of the listen level. Then there's the spell level. The spell level is another LSTM model, which, is, which simply acts as a language model. Now, instead of words, the spell model is outputting letters and letter sequences are output with blanks. We can also output blanks. And the idea is when you have a letter sequence with blank on both sides, that becomes a word. So this is what it outputs, not words, but letters. It's a normal LSTM model with which where the current letter is dependent upon the current hidden state of the LSTM and the previous letter output by the previous state of the LSTM. And finally, we have the attend model where the decoder at any particular point in time when it is outputting a letter Y3 is looking not just at the hidden state S3 and the previous letter Y2, but it is also looking at the encoder representations. But it is trying to attend to the encoder representations in an intelligent fashion. The way it does this is it forms a score between the hidden state S3 and each of the encoder states H1 through H, T, T, T by two in this case. And these scores, which are re represented here as the E, Z3, 1, E3, 2, and so forth, they are passed through a softmax to give us a Score, uh, to give us a weight alpha. Alpha tells us how much to weight each of these hidden representations on the encoder side. And so the weighted summation of alpha and the hidden representations on the encoder side gives us a representation on the encoder side that we need to use to output a particular output uh, at time three at, in the decoder. Okay, so the decoder is basically saying which encoder hidden state should I attend to most? Is it H2, is it H3, or is it somewhere in the, uh, uh, in the a combination of H2 and H3? I'm gonna be looking at that to output Y3, right? And so using this kind of attention, we can get pretty good results in, in, in this sort of end-to-end -end system. So 
where I'm, I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but in essence, what happens is the decoder is using attention to decide what to attend to on the encoder to output a specific decoder hidden representation, which is then used to output the final letter on the decoder side. Now, uh, encoder decoder models uh, with attention for speech recognition, these last models are outputting letter sequences with blanks. And it turns out that because you train these on actual word sequences, these letter sequences tend to never output words which are not real words. In fact, they're always real words. Not only that, because you're outputting letter sequences, we can output words that were never seen during training. In other words, there is no out of vocabulary problem with these sort of end-to-end -end neural models. Turns out that these models actually give better accuracy than conventional models but they are non-streaming because we use a bi-directional LSTM on the encoder side. More recently, techniques like recurrent neural network transducers or RNNTs enable streaming because they do not use bi-directional LSTMs, but they are not as accurate. More recently this year, Google, I think this year or last year, Google put out a paper which combined RNNTs in the first pass to produce a bunch of hypotheses that are rescored by a LAS model in the second pass. And this model is an end-to-end -end speech recognition system with attention, an encoder-decoder model using attention that is actually more accurate and better at in, in latency compared to conventional hybrid HMM neural network systems. So these are a bunch of papers here that you can refer to, which describe the various things I talked about. And this brings us to our conclusion of uh, the technology review for image and video understanding. And we will take some questions here. And after that, we will start up our presentation on applications at LinkedIn for image and video representation.